Well, good morning, everyone. So good to be with you in worship this morning, and welcome to all of you with us online today. Uh, There are many of you every week, and we love you and we miss you. We hope you're well, and uh, that includes the love of my life, Andrea, and my daughter, Ellie. I hope you are enjoying Houston and getting a win in this soccer tournament in Jesus' name. Nikki, my sister in Christ, I honor you. Thank you for sharing your story. Uh, it, It touches me every time I hear it. Nikki and I have coffee every July, truly, ever since 2016. We have coffee in July, and we celebrate what God has done in her life, and I hope you feel the church celebrating you today and what God has done and accomplished. Amen. Um, Rebecca McLaughlin, don't know where you're sitting. They're usually over here somewhere. Welcome to Redeemer. So glad to have you here and thankful for your ministry this evening uh, to our women's ministry, and I might be in the balcony. I confess. Um, Hey, just a quick update on my health. Um, I thank you so much for your prayer over the last few months. It's been a waiting game, uh, waited uh, April 19th until May 24th for surgery, waited May 24th until June 6th to hear the word benign, and waited from June 6th until this last Monday to find out uh, how my surgeon felt about the scans. I've got a picture of him, a handsome fella. That's Dr. Barnett uh, down at UT Southwestern this last week, Uh, my post-op checkup and he loves what he saw. So all good with the scans. Praise God for that. Um, If if the meningioma was still present to any degree, I may have been looking at radiation, so just waiting to hear what future steps would be required, and I'm just grateful now that uh, it's just a six-month MRI checkup. I praise God for that. Um, So wanted to share that with you, and I thank you for praying for him. He was on our prayer list as we went in uh, for surgery in May and and just grateful for him. His wife grew up just down the road, by the way. It's pretty cool. Are you enjoying James? Are you enjoying this series? Uh, This this has been fun for me in study and in research and preaching. Um, I'm gonna start today with an illustration. I, I love my wife. Oh, I love her. I adore her. Uh, We've been married 19 years, one month and three days. And um, I, I'm going to give you this illustration here. We, we, we have uh, done our fair share of marriage counseling with younger couples who are engaged to be married, and they just want to sit and talk about different topics with a married couple. And um, let, let's, let's pretend that one of those young couples uh, approached Andrea and I and, and requested to stay with us an entire weekend to shadow us to learn about marriage. Let's just pretend that, that this happened. And then after this, the young couple's talking to you, and they said, you know, it's interesting. Adam, we, we, we've heard that he loves his wife dearly, but when we stayed with the Barnetts that weekend, Adam really didn't act in a loving way the entire time. We see him loving on Andrea. He wasn't helpful around the house. He didn't do any dishes. He didn't help with the trash. Uh, one day, she, she drove home with a trunk full of groceries and said, Adam, come help me unload the groceries. He said, do it yourself. <laughs> and this is, this is their observation that they're sharing with you after shadowing us. Adam didn't hold her hand. She tried to lay a kiss on him. He wasn't having it. He said, no, thank you. <laughs> One night, he even went out back and grilled himself dinner and didn't grill her anything to eat. <laughs> and they're confused as they're relaying their observation Uh, to you, they're confused. Why? Because I said that I loved my wife. They've heard that I love my wife, but there wasn't any evidence of that love. And that's what James is doing in chapter two. You have faith in God. Awesome. But there's got to be some evidence of your faith. This appropriately follows last week's sermon where you heard from 122, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. And then what does it say? Do. Do what it says. Given the theme of Christian maturity throughout this entire text, this is a natural question 
for James to be answering here. If someone claims to be a believer but is not maturing in a way that their life is bearing fruit, y'all know the vine and the branch, when they're connected, there ought to be fruit from that relationship. If you say you're a believer, but you're not maturing in a way that you are bearing fruit in your lives, is that person, James is asking, is that person really a believer? Where's the evidence of their Christian faith? So faith is the key concept that we're looking at in scripture today and exploring in this passage. So let's jump in. We're in James chapter two. We're gonna start with verse 14. If you wanna go there in your Bibles or on your phones, it'll also be on the screens. What good is it, my brothers and sisters? By the way, pay attention to how James is teaching us here through questions. He asks a lot of questions in this passage. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is what? Dead. Faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Prior to this passage, earlier in chapter two, James is writing and he's forbidding favoritism in the church. He's forbidding favoritism in the body of Christ, and he does so in relation to the relationship between the rich and the poor. He specifically points out a brother or a sister lacking basic necessities of clothing and food. And I want you to notice it could be a brother here, according to James, or a sister in need, maybe emphasizing a sister because women without the provision of a husband or a father at this time were often more needy and more easily overlooked in society. A woman without the provision of a husband and a father or a father would have been most likely poor and definitely vulnerable. So he says brother or sister. And the person here speaking clearly understands the need, right? They walk up, they see someone, someone is cold and someone is hungry. But there is an extreme contrast here between the person's words and their actions or inaction. These two verbs are either passive, which would be the person saying to the poor person, be warmed and be filled. I mean, maybe well wishes, right? I see your situation and I hope that you are warmed and I hope that you are filled and that your needs are met. Or worse, this could be a middle verb, which would be the person saying to the poor person, I see what you're going through. Warm yourself. Fill yourself. And if that's the case, this insult to the poor person is even more outrageous. Did words without action profit the poor person? That's a real question from a preacher to a church. Come on, talk to me. Did, in this story, in this analogy that James is using to teach, did words without action profit the poor person? No. Nor do we profit from faith without works. James is teaching us that saying or claiming something without a corresponding action is of no value. A person cannot, you already know this, this isn't, this isn't a very profound statement, but a person cannot be warmed and be fed with affirming words about being warmed and fed. I can't just see you and say, be warmed, be fed, and poof. It lacks action. In the same way, faith that is not accompanied by action is dead. Thus, I give you the sermon title today. Faith's funeral, this is when we put faith to death. Verse 18, 
James brings in an imaginary partner to this discussion. But someone, but someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds, show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe there's one God. Good. Even the demons believe that. And what do they do? They shudder. This refers to Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, the Shema prayer, the Hebrew word for hear. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then James gets a little bit sarcastic here with this imaginary partner in this discussion. You believe the Lord is one. Good, he says. Even the demons believe that. I'm glad you believe that. Even the demons are monotheistic. Even the demons agree that there is one God. But belief that there is one God does not cle- clearly does not signify the presence of a saving faith in the demons, correct? That's why James is unpacking this and saying there's more. And there also might be a more subtle point that James is making here. Even the demon's faith results in some sort of outward response. They shudder. The word here for tremble means more than slight shuddering. It means, and it refers to an uncontainable, uncontrollable, violent shaking due to fear. Even the demons respond. Verse 20. You foolish person. Do you want, here it is, evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Do you remember the quote that I shared uh, in week one of this series? I forget now who said it, but it, it's somebody who said that, that James is a difficult text to teach and to preach because of his seemingly harsh tone, is what the author said. Well, here it is. Because the Greek word here for foolish, you foolish person, in the NIV, it actually means empty. So this is better read, you empty person. Do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? And then he moves here from the hypothetical example of a person that's cold and hungry, he moves to historical examples. Verse 21, was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete. We heard that word two weeks ago, complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited, credited to him as righteousness. And he was called what? God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. We are familiar with themes in Abraham's story from your own study of the Bible and from the 14 weeks we just spent this summer studying Genesis. And it begins with suffering trials. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you this, and I, I can't tell you this from experience, because in all of my years of parenting, God has never made the request of me to sacrifice one of my children. Two of them out of the four are right here, and they're thrilled. And somebody said, praise God, yes. In all of my parenting, I've nev- God has never said, Adam, here's the greater plan. You need to sacrifice this child. But I'm going to bet that if that happened, that's a trial. You agree with me? That's a trial. That would have resulted in extreme internal struggle, right? And then, as a father of four, I'm also going to make the assumption that at some point inside Abraham's thinking, he was tempted not to go through with it. Is that fair, too? As a daddy, he probably was thinking, you know, I'm going to create a better plan, communicate that plan to God, and we're going to do this my way, right? So, so we see in Abraham's story, it starts with a trial, suffering. It then goes to temptation. I don't want to do this, God. But what did he do? Even still through the trial and even still through the temptation, what did he do? 
He acted. He acted upon what God was asking of him. Faith, yes, we see his faith, but action. Faith in action. And we know that God intervenes and spares his son Isaac, and as a result, Abraham's faith grew. It says right here, he was called God's friend. In the process of learning more about God's character, it only further reinforces his faith. And the same is true for you and me. Now the secret sauce of this teaching is in verse 22. Abraham's faith and Abraham's actions. They worked together. Faith and action working together. This is the imperfect form which emphasizes that this is not just one moment in time in Abraham's past that his faith and his action had to work together, but this is ongoing. This is daily, this is hourly, this is minute by minute, working itself out in our daily lives, otherwise known as what? Sanctification, the process of growing to be more like Jesus Christ through trials, through temptation, through suffering, a lifetime of growing obedience to God. I have made a diagram to further illustrate this. And I did this in PowerPoint, and I'm proud of it. I'm not a graphic artist, but we're going to work with this. So this, this, is, this is how I read James chapter 2. I just kind of took it conceptually and put it in a diagram for us. Faith, salvation, the moment of salvation, we put our faith in Christ, is then worked out through practical, dim- you got to do this because I didn't know how to make the words bend practical demonstrations for the good of my neighbor. As those practical demonstrations for the good of others become works, good deeds in our lives, that's the process of sanctification, we're more and more like Jesus as we work out our faith, we're also then made more mature and more complete, lacking nothing. And what I really want you to see in this diagram is I feel like it's understood, and I've thought this way before in the past too, it's understood that I'm going to come to faith and then because I'm a Christian, I'm going to do good deeds. What I really want you to see is that our faith informs our works. Our faith informs the good deeds that we do for the good of our neighbor, but then our works inform our faith again. And over and over again, our faith is the reason we go out and do good deeds, but then our good deeds reinforce our faith. We're learning more about God's character. Sunerge is that Greek word right there, meaning working together. And I want you to listen as I say it. What do you hear? What do you hear in this word? Sunerge. Sooner. <laughs> what James is doing here, guys, what James is doing is he's, he's giving us text that reinforces our faith in the Sooners. I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, just relax. Do, do you hear the word synergy? This is where we, this word for working together is where we get our word synergy. What happens to the synergy of faith and works when we become inconsistent or unintentional? It dies. And that's the point that James is making. They continue to inform one another every day of our lives. But if we just have faith and we don't have deeds, James is saying, hold on now. We got a little bit of a problem. Verse 23, sorry, 25. In the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different location? Now look at the contrast here. With Abraham, we have this wealthy, faithful patriarch, the father of the Jewish nation, a major figure in society. But now James uses Rahab as an example. Probably poor, definitely, absolutely immoral, and not much of a figure in society. James even adds the word prostitute, just so we know exactly who we're talking about here. Both of these Old Testament figures who lived very different lives and had very different stories Both of these Old Testament figures became models of 
faith because of their deeds. Their deeds are recorded in history for us to see, for us to understand how their faith was put into action. And this shows us that everyone in between, whether Abraham or Rahab, all believers in between, no matter what your story, we're all called to the same thing, demonstrations, good deeds that reveal our faith in the life-transforming gospel of Jesus Christ. Finally, verse 26. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Here James gives one last analogy to answer the question that we began with in verse 14. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? I'm going to give you this quote from Craig Blomberg on this. He writes that the answer, throughout all the arguments and examples from 2.14 to 26, has been a resounding no. Faith that does not reveal itself in works and a changed lifestyle that glorifies God and seeks his heart for the world is dead, lifeless, workless, and worthless. In reality, it is not faith at all. It is only the shell or the corpse of faith. I'll summarize it this way. Faith without works doesn't work. That's what James is saying. Faith without works doesn't work. If you have faith and the life-transforming gospel of Jesus Christ has taken root in your heart and you are the vine and the branch relationship with the King of kings and Lord of lords, your life is going to look different. There's going to be evidence of that faith. Now, perhaps as I've preached this sermon, something happened to you that happened to me as I wrote it. I started thinking about Paul. I started thinking about how Paul and James, they, they treat this differently. They write differently about faith and about works. It might be a great exercise for you this week to go do some research and study and write out what are the differences? How do Paul and James approach faith and works? How are they similar? How are they different? I'm just gonna give you a few examples now. Paul deals with how new life in Christ begins. James deals with how life in Christ grows, matures. Paul speaks of obedience not being the means of our justification. And James speaks of good deeds that will flow from our salvation. Paul focuses on how one is made right with God. James is saying, here's the evidence that you are right with God. They come at it from different angles. But there's one thing that they agree on. And I agree with them, and I think you would as well. And I want to end this message with this. Salvation is not, it never has been, and it never will be about how good of a person you are. Salvation is not, it never has been, and it never will be based on your behavior. Salvation is not, never has been, and never will be based on any tradition. Salvation is through Jesus Christ alone, period. Amen? Would you pray with me? Lord, James can be difficult but we thank you for your Holy Spirit teaching us through this text about how we ought to view trials, about how we ought to approach moments of temptation, about faith that must be accompanied by good deeds. Help us to work that out in our daily lives. And why? Well, that's in Scripture too so that others might see our good deeds and glorify you, our Father in heaven. 
Through the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, we pray. And everyone said, amen. Can we stand and worship together?